There's something captivating about this simple Christmas hymn with its almost childlike wonder. The first stanza is a series of declarative statements that invite the singer to marvel at Christ's birth as we are as if we are physically present there in Bethlehem. Our attention is first drawn to the heavens. We hear in this song a song that the angels are singing. Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth. We see the star, the one that guided the Magi in Matthew chapter 2. Then we refocus our attention to the scene immediately around us. We see the mother in prayer, and hear the cry of the baby. And the final line of the opening stanza ties the heavenly and earthly scene together, and the paradox of this vision becomes apparent. Heavenly events are pointing to the most humble of settings in a small, out-of-the-way village, the birth of the king. The lyrics were written by Josiah Gilbert Holland, who was himself born in a poor and struggling family in Massachusetts. After working in a factory to help the family finances, he went to school studying at Berkshire Medical College, where he graduated in 1844. After attempting to establish a medical practice in western Massachusetts, he gave it up and moved to the south, taking a teaching position first in Richmond, Virginia, and then in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Our Christmas hymn dates from the last decade of Holland's life. In 1872, it appeared first in the brilliant collection of Sunday School songs edited by Covenant T. Giff. And the final three stanzas of the hymn continue with graphic phrases that appeal to eye and ear as Holland more fully unfolds the scene at the birth of the Christ. The third stanza exemplifies 19th century American romantic poetry at its full flow. This hymn probably originated in the 12th century in France. It's sometimes named the Song of the Ass, the Donkey Carol, or the Gift of the Animals. It is distinctive in that each of the animals sings to the newborn Christ child in the first person, offering a gift to comfort it. Stanza one sets the scene in a stable room with the baby surrounded by these friendly beasts. Our relationship to the child is familiar, one of a brother, strong and good. The setting is humble yet warm and inviting. Each of the next four stanzas is taken by one of the beasts who offered Jesus a gift. And the final stanza summarizes that all the beasts, by some good spell, were pleased to offer a gift to Emmanuel. The good spell has a sense of a magical event in which even the animals are engaged in the mystery. Drawing upon a moral tradition found in some folk songs, the final line of each stanza repeats the first line exactly. This technique would allow all gathered to join in the song without any printed music. And as a result, they entered into the story singing only the last line. This may be the only commonly sung Christmas carol in our hymnal that does not mention the birth of Christ. The focus is rather on the song of the angels, peace on the earth, good will to men. The carol was written by Massachusetts native Edmund Hamilton Sears, who earned a degree from Harvard Divinity School and was ordained a Unitarian minister in 1839. He served several congregations throughout Massachusetts. The United Methodist, as United Methodist single editor Carlton Young puts it, the hymn's central theme contrasts the spirit of war with the song of the angels. Peace to God's people. 
Young considers this carol to be one of the earliest social gospel hymns ever written in the United States. We joyfully sing, hark the herald angels sing, and joy to the world each Christmas season. But there will always be those moments when we realize that the message of peace has not yet been fully realized here on earth. That's when we should sing, it came upon a midnight clear, and the power of the reincarnate of the incarnation and the message of the gospel will touch us even more deeply. <clears throat> the lyrics of Angels from the Realms of Glory were written by James Montgomery. He followed in the footsteps of two famous poets, Isaac Watts and Charles Wesley. In many hymnals, he's well represented, third only to Watts and Wesley, or British hymn writers before 1850. He has six original hymns in our United Methodist Hymnal. American hymnologist Albert Bailey notes that one cannot call him a great poet, but he knew how to express with sincerity, fervor, simplicity, and beauty the emotions and aspirations of common Christians. British hymnologist J.R. Watson states James Montgomery was a well-known poet, highly thought of by his contemporaries, such as Shelley and Bryant. There was, there is a fifth stanza to this carol that wasn't included in our hymn. Sinners run with true repentance, doomed for guilt to endless pains. Justice now revokes your sentence. Mercy calls you, break your chains. That verse seems harsh to our modern years, and indeed it seems to end the Christian Christmas hymn as a bit of a downer but it completes a thoughtful progression from the first to the last stanza. The angels sing in stanza one, leading to the shepherd's adoration in stanza two, and the sage's gifts in stanza three. And finally, to saints praise in heaven in stanza four. The lyrics to this hymn were written by Christina Georgiana Rosetti. She gives us one of the most beloved of Christmas hymns. She's the author of three collections of mostly religious poetry and four devotional books. She came from a Spaniard who was steeped in the arts. Her deep faith is thought, thought to be partially the result of the solace she found in writing as a result of her poor health at age 16. In the first stanza, Rosetti creates a dreary and desolate image of a world in which the infant Jesus appeared by drawing on the experience of a British woman. She's not suggesting that it literally slowed, snowed in Bethlehem, but is drawing on a long established literary idea of associating snow with Christ's birth. Rosetti's image reminds me of winters in central New York where they are often cold and snowy. I was first introduced to this hymn back in the 80s in the Port Byron United Methodist Church. We used to sing it as a choir almost every Sunday after Christmas. So I learned the tenor part. And I remember those days because they were cold and snowy. So the first Noel is one of the oldest Christmas carols in our hymn. It's really an epiphany carol that raises several questions. The first of which is, what is a carol? While the majority of carols are associated with Christmas, the folk carol tradition was employed at other high seasons of the Christmas year, Christian year, including Holy Week. And Jesus. Although Christmas carols are found throughout the world, their origin is largely European. Usually, no author or composer can be ascribed to. Historically, 
carols would have been sung outside the Catholic Mass in non-liturgical gatherings and spread through world tradition. In their earliest forms, the carols would have been ways of preserving and spreading biblical or quasi-religious narratives among those who were not literate. Christmas hymns, by contrast, are part of the literate song tradition. While carols began to flourish during the medieval era, Christmas hymns can be traced back to the 4th century during the Council of Nicaea and subsequent councils, where the adoption of the Nicene Creed defined the nature of Christ in what became Orthodox theology. Early Latin hymns from this time were polemic statements that explained the doctrine of incarnation in opposition to Arianism, a concept, a concept that asserted that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was created by God at a specific point in time and was an entity distinct from God the Father and therefore subordinate to the Father. Concordi matas de parentis, or the Father's love begotten, in our hymnal number 184, is one of the most famous hymns from this era that is still sung today. And Spanish judge Aurelius Clemens Prudentus left a legacy for the church's sung faith that has lasted for centuries. Since that time, telling the story of the birth of Christ in song has been an important tradition, especially in the Western Church. Since congregational participation, including singing, was very limited in the medieval Catholic Mass, the people's songs were developed outside the church. In most cases, the composers of these carols have been long lost in time, hardly a function of their oral tradition. Undoubtedly, Carols existed in all form long before being published in collections. So the first Noel has its roots in the 15th century in its oral form and appeared in the 18th century on song lists in Helston near Cornwall. It was published first in the revised edition of some ancient Christmas carols in 1823. It was edited by Davies Gilbert. Its publication in the famous Christmas Carols Ancient and Modern in 1833 was compiled by William Sands in London. That increased the carols' prominence. There were originally nine stanzas, and we sing five of them. Through the angel's appearance to the shepherds, though the angel's appearance to the shepherds is subject to the first stanza, most of the carol focuses on the journey of the wise men and giving the carol a very epiphany feel. Most of the information that I brought you has come from a United Methodist Discipleship Ministries website, which contains a whole collection of hymns that have been presented uh, or that are present in both the faith we sing and in our hymnal. 